Welcome to the Hangar Z podcast, brought to you by Vertical Helicasts. In this two-part series, we sit down and talk with Desiree Horton. With over 33 years of aviation experience and over 10,000 flight hours under her belt, Desiree brings a wealth of experience to the world of public safety aviation. Currently serving as a fire rescue pilot for Kern County Fire Department, she's dedicated her career to protecting lives and property from the skies. Desiree Horton embarked on her aviation journey in 1990 in Southern California, navigating some of the busiest airspace and operating out of the Van Nuys Airport, one of the busiest airports. Her diverse background includes flying tours, charter flights, news coverage, traffic watch, and movie production work. For almost half her career, she honed her skills in various aviation roles before realizing her dream of becoming a fire pilot. The path to becoming a fire pilot was challenging in the early days with limited opportunities for those without prior experience. Undeterred, Desiree financed her own training for long line and mountain courses, securing a position with a company willing to give her a chance. She made history by becoming the first female pilot on an exclusive use contract for Region 5 with the U.S. Forest Service. After years of serving as a contract pilot for the U.S. Forest Service, Desiree achieved her goal of working for a fire department in Southern California. In 2013, she joined Cal Fire as a full-time female fire helicopter pilot, dedicated almost seven years to the organization. Continuing her trailblazing career, she moved on to the Orange County Fire Department in her hometown, where she became the first woman to work in air operations and as a pilot for the department. Currently, Desiree is breaking new ground with the Kern County Fire Department as the first ever female fire and rescue pilot. Driven by a desire to encourage women to explore opportunities in public safety aviation, she aspires to overcome obstacles and promote a positive culture within the industry. Thank you to our sponsors, CNC Technologies, Anodyne Electronics, Manufacturing, and Metro Aviation. Welcome to the Hangar Z Podcast, brought to you by Vertical Helicasts. The Hangar Z Podcast is the first and only podcast dedicated to promoting and exploring the personnel and equipment behind the missions in public safety aviation. Join your host, John Gray, Jeff Ratkovich, and Jack Shanley. So southbound, skidding to a stop, stand by here. Looks like you're getting ready to bail. Heads up, guys, bailing. Okay, the guy, he's running through the house, jumping the fence, through the shotgun, threw something out. Grabbing the shotgun. Don't go over that fence. Don't go over that fence. Grab the shotgun again. He is armed. Stay there. Hold your position. Four on the stop. Good advising. Coast one on the stop. You've you've made it a long way in your career, you know, and in your you're you're still doing your thing. You're still happy, and you saw this kind of infectious attitude towards aviation that I think, you know, most everybody has. But it's really cool to see it still after after thirty years. Uh, looking back on the time that you've that you've spent in aviation and all the jobs you've had, is there one that you're like, oh, this was probably my, my the favorite era or the favorite time of, of my piloting career? My biggest accomplishment, I mean, actually just about every job any, anywhere I've worked has been a, an accomplishment, but I worked my whole career to get a fire department job. And I remember when I got picked up with Cal Fire, I thought, wow, this is it. I made it. You know, I have my fire department job. And then I made the decision you know, six years in to leave and go to a department that was closer to home and had a more diverse mission, did more rescues versus fire. And I I would have more um, community involvement, which is what I was looking for. I felt very isolated at Cal Fire. I felt like I, I didn't have community involvement. I didn't do as many rescues as I wanted to. And, and so that was the change I was looking for. And for me, when I did work for Orange County Fire, that was, that was, some of the greatest times, um, you know, there's some people who would say, oh, you're crazy, you know, despite how it ended, you know, I, for a lot of people that don't know, I didn't make probation while I was working there. And um, I was actually warned to not leave Cal Fire and that I was not welcome at Orange County Fire and that their culture would not be welcoming of a female pilot or any female in air operations. And, and I went anyway, because my whole career, I've always been like, you're not going to discourage me from doing what I wanted to do. Like when I started taking flying lessons, the I remember the owner of the flight school says, why do you want to do this? Why are, why are you wasting your money? Why aren't you going to travel and, you know, go to Europe with your friends? Cause I made those sacrifices. I didn't get to travel and have fun with my friends when I was a kid. And um, he said, you know, you're, you're never going to be rich. You know, you're always going to be struggling. And um, he was right. <laughs> You know, when it came to that, especially flying in the private sector, you know, you're always going from job to job, trying to find job security and trying to get that next best dream job. And, you know, it was, wasn't was until I got into the fire service that, you know, I started building the pension and having the benefits and the job security, although it pays less because you have those benefits. Um, you know, it's it's crazy when I think about it, because I remember that owner of that flight school said, 
you're going to get bored. You're going to, you're going to hate this job. And to this day, I still get excited. There's days that I go out there and we fly and it, it could be something as simple as just we're flying from point A to point B. We're not even on a fire or a rescue. And I see something cool and I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. And I can't believe I get to experience this. Like very few people in the world experience it. There's places I go and things I see that no other pilot will even see. It's, it's, it's exclusive to just our response area and where we fly. So it just, it's cool. That's that's all I could say is, you know, someone once said, you know, what's that saying? You know, choose a career you love and you'll never work a day in your life. And that's how I feel. I always felt like that too. Every day that we we launched, looking around, like we're getting paid to do this. And again, I talked about pinch myself earlier, like I had to pinch myself and make sure this isn't a dream because, you know, in California would be flying along the coastline and you're looking around and you're like, holy cow, this is one of the most beautiful places on earth. And I'm flying in a helicopter and I'm getting paid. I'm not paying to do it. Uh, so yeah. maintaining that positive outlook and, and attitude, I think is, is crucial and you've got it, you know, it, like, like I said, see that positivity and, 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 uh, happiness that, that you have that exudes towards a- aviation and, and helicopters in particular. And that's really cool. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I commend you for that for sure. Oddly, you know, one, one of the neatest parts of, of flight was, is taken off. And I love when the sun's in a certain position and it casts a shadow outside of the ship of the, of the ship on the ground as you're coming off. And that was always a reminder to me of, of how cool it is, like the thing that we're doing, you know, and uh, that's the one thing I, I miss to this day is, is seeing that shadow and, and just, you know, that, that forward for part of flight was, was awesome. That's funny. I'm all about the shadows too. Even when the helicopter is on the ground, if the sun is at such an angle, I'll take a photo because the shadow will be bigger than the helicopter yeah, and then yeah, flying. Yeah. I'm always, I always see my shadow. I'm like, Hey, who's, who's following us? You know, <laughs> yeah. it's like the dumbest thing, but it's so cool to see your shadow. It's a lot of fun. I, you could tell anytime somebody's in aviation, cause you look at their phone and there's a thousand pictures. It's probably the same picture a thousand times of a helicopter with a shadow or a sunset or a sunrise or, you know, something, but it's, you know, mostly aviation related. Uh, so for, for you, Richard, what was probably the most picturesque uh, scene that you were a part of flying over over London or, or or over the area that you patrolled? I just found London is like I suppose like any big city is totally different by day and by night. So when you when when night time or darkness takes away all of the the visual references, it replaces them with neon lights. Um, I just don't think there is anything more beautiful than looking at your your home city at night, illuminated in multiple colours. These days, with advertising hoardings and neon lights around hotels, you know, you we we would. I just never ever got tired of seeing the city at night, and I think that's when you realise exactly the point you just made, both of you, is that. I'm getting paid to do this. People pay good money to come and see this on a tourist helicopter flight, and I'm getting paid to actually be here. So I always say, whenever you have a bad day at work, whenever you know you think you perhaps you know things are not going well, you have to remind yourself how lucky you are, how privileged you are to be um, getting paid to fly in. I mean, for my case, fly in helicopters. In your case, is fly helicopters and get paid to do so. So yeah, I, I I think that for me is the uh, memory. I, I recently flew back into Heathrow after uh, been on holiday and uh, we flew right over London um, as we came into land and uh, I took some photos out of the window of the aeroplane because just to remind myself because I haven't flown for a few years just how beautiful the city is at night. Yeah, yeah, how cool. The, the point you bring about the lights is funny. I remember, gosh, it's probably about five years ago now when the LED billboards first became a thing. Uh, Ontario is about 30 miles east of LA, but we'd be flying. And when it first came online, like this, this billboard, it was an led billboard. that was on a side of a, a large building. I'm like, what is that light? I mean, you could see it. It's clear as day and it's, you know, nine, 10 o'clock at night, super dark, but you can't make out what it is. And we finally, we, we flew down to the LA basin and, and saw it's a, it was a billboard attached to the side of a building. You could see for 30 miles. It's like, holy cow, that stuff's bright, you know? So 
Uh, the nighttime stuff is, yeah, it's, it's always amazing, especially when you're in a, a major city like LA or I'd imagine London. So yeah, very cool. Yeah. I, I do miss the beauty of flying over LA. I remember flying, you know, tours and for the news flying at night, how beautiful it was at the city. Like you said, those, those lights can be seen 30 miles away and um, they have a lot, a lot more new buildings and more lights and there's just more to see. And it's, it's just super spectacular. And um, even just the beaches flying over the coast, I, I, I miss flying over the, the ocean. That's, that was tough um, to give that up. And, you know, but what I see now, we go from one extreme to the next, you know, I've got like the hot desert in the summer. And then in the winter, we have snow covered mountains, the roads are closed. In fact, driving to work is always a challenge. It's more of a challenge than flying sometimes trying to get there. But um, it's beautiful. Just this last year, we had a lot of snow. And I recently started using a GoPro and, and got some really cool photos and videos of us flying in the snow. And it was it's pretty nice. It's pretty cool. I guess the difference is when you're when you're flying in a predominantly urban area, so you're flying over Los Angeles or over London, it, you it, you can see an awful lot because of the lights. So you've got that kind of slightly reassuring spatial awareness. You know, you know where you are, you know how far away you are from the ground. It must be very different, and certainly I've experienced it when we fly outside of London into the more rural areas, and you literally can't see anything, maybe a tiny little collection of lights where you've got a, a town or a, a small uh, village. But I suppose that's when Envis comes in and you start to, uh, and you muster up in the mountains where you're flying in the snow, you know, flying on goggles. I guess you see the world through a very different set of eyes than you do in the city where it's almost so bright because of all the lights that you don't need the Envis. Um, I, I, I guess you fly a lot on goggles probably in firefighting, do you, or is it not so much? We do. We we respond 24-7 to calls, so we're all risk. And so we do go to fires at night and we go to rescues at night. And where we're based is in the middle of nowhere. We're in the southern Sierras uh, between Bakersfield and Tatchby in a small town called Keene. And there's no city, so there's no light. So immediately when we take off, it's pitch black. We're in the mountains. Uh, we're down in the bottom of a little bowl. If you take off and you fly straight, you're going to hit a hill no matter what direction you go. If we weren't on goggles, we wouldn't be able to do the mission. And so it is the most challenging flying I've ever done in my career. I didn't think it would get, I didn't think it would get harder. I thought at this point in my life, I was going to ease into my retirement job and, you know, be somewhere where we, we don't fly in extreme environments, but it is really cool, the stuff we see. Um, but yeah, we don't have the, any city lights where we respond. There's a a lot of nights where we don't have a moon and it's really challenging to fly out there in the mountains at night. It's a per perfect segue into telling us where are you working now and what's your current assignment? Well, I work for Kern County Fire Department and I am a fire rescue pilot for them as well as their aviation safety officer for their air program, which that's the first time I've ever had that title. Were you, were you voluntold or did you volunteer for it? <laughs> uh, voluntold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But being that I'm kind of a safety Nazi, um, you know, it's it's actually refreshing. Although I'm still met with resistance when it comes to change. That's that's uh, one of those things where when you try to change things, you, you're met with a little bit of resistance when, when people are used to doing things a certain way. But I've always been... Um, the kind of pilot that's like, Hey, if we could do this better or, you know, I, I follow the book, like some, a simple example, um, you know, tying the aircraft down, there was a agency I worked for, uh, we won't name names, but they, they didn't like it when I told them that they had to tie the tail rotor down. They needed to tie the main rotor down. They needed to put sunshades in to protect the radio, the radios and the avionics. They, anything I brought up, they, they just, they didn't want to hear it. But um, where I work now, they, they love that stuff. They've been doing that. And, you know, I'm, I built our, our SMS program and we now have a, a really nice system that we use to assess our flights and our safety risk every day. Um, and it's just, it's a work in progress. We're working on some other things now, but yeah, it's a lot of fun and I'm new to that role. So I'm learning as I go. Yeah. That's a, that's a uh, challenging role to be in. Especially like I, I inherited a program that it really hadn't gotten super developed. So we're trying to implement pro, a program based on other people's programs and trying to mold it to how our operation works. That was that was really challenging. 
is your safety program already in existence or are you kind of building it from the ground up? It was, uh, I built it from the ground up and we had nothing. Um, I wouldn't say we had nothing. We had uh, basically a, a piece of paper and it had a few questions on it and it was just, you, you'd fill it out and you'd um, post it on the, the board and it literally was just a little piece of paper and everything was handwritten. And so that was how they did their um, flight risk analysis tool before. And now we, the department approved the purchase of a program and um, with that program, they have some some templates as examples, but they didn't have a fire or a rescue template. It was either, you know, law enforcement or EMS or, you know, some other type of general aviation. And I had to to try to figure out what questions were going to be pertinent to what we did and and how to score it and build that. And it took a while. It took um, some time to, you know, get input from other pilots and figure out what was working. So, yeah, I, I built that from the ground up. So that was kind of cool. And I like I said, I, I'm new to it. So I'm still learning how to do all of that. Yeah, that's that's really cool. Looking back over your career as a as a fire pilot, every every time I say fire pilot pilot, I think I'm saying fighter pilot. It sounds like the same. But <laughs> <laughs> I've had people actually think that I they're all, oh, what do you do for a living? I'm all fire pilot. And why you're a fire pilot? <laughs> and that happened a lot. <laughs> but what would you say the 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 most challenging part of of flying in that environment is? Thank you to our sponsor, CNC Technologies. CNC Technologies, serving law enforcement, government, and military markets with tailored mission solutions, system training, and live 24 7 support with CNC.live platform. Explore more at CNCTechnologies.com. Just the, the weather, you know, whether it's, um, you know, on a fire, we deal with extreme heat, we deal with extreme winds. Um, changing winds, high altitudes, the elevation, um, we're constantly at our limits. We're at max gross weights. We're never, we're never light. We're always heavy. We're full of fuel, full of water, full of people, no matter what we're doing, whether it's a cruise shuttle or dropping water, it's definitely challenging. Um, just operating at the altitudes and dealing with the fire weather, um, you know, in these fires, they create their, their own weather. You know, you'll, you'll see like buildup, you'll see storm clouds, um, build up over these fires because the the changes in temperature in the atmosphere and a large fire will, will create that. And then it becomes a risk because next thing you know, it, it, it looks like a storm under there. It's gray skies and you can get wind shear and that, that column can collapse and um, could be very dangerous. And I've actually been on fires where they've actually pulled us off the fire and grounded all the aircraft because of the the weather it, it, that the fire created got so severe. I remember working on the ground as a U.S. Forest Service firefighter. You knew you're on a good fire when you look up and there's a, a header that doesn't just involve smoke. It's, like you said, the, the clouds that form above it too. And most of the campaign fires that you go on are, are of course, they're big fires, so you're going to see that on most of the fires. Um, looking back over the course of your fire career, what's the most memorable campaign fire that you've been on? I would say probably the Zaka fire, just because we were on it for the entire summer. I mean, I, I think that thing burned from the beginning of fire season till the end. And it was really just the experience, like all the people I worked with, the the people that I met on that fire that became longtime friends that I'd run into on fires later. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of people that I met that, that were like pivotal to be in my life for the rest of my fire career. And um, so that was a lot of fun. And just, you know, the experience... And it was fun. It was it was kind of a cool area. I remember um, we had different hella bases throughout the fire because it was such a large fire. And one of them was on the the side of the fire where Michael Jackson lived at the time. So when I was doing, I was flying a Type Three at the time. And whenever I would do a recon flight, I would always like kind of joke around and point that out. I'm all there's never land out our right door <laughs> on the way to the fire, and the the fire guys loved it. It was kind of a neat little fire to be on. So this was the Los Padres National Forest? Is that the area that you were working in? Yeah. Yeah. The LP. Yeah. The Zaka fire. I think that was two, 2007. Okay. So, yeah. My last year, the Forest Service was 2004, I believe. Yeah, 2004. Oh, okay. So I, I, I missed that one. But that was, I'm assuming, uh, Santa Barbara, that whole area so surrounding Santa Barbara? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It burned literally from, I think, where the day fire ended all the way to, yeah, that that next county over at the time it was a historic fire since then there's been larger fires but at that time it had been like 
the largest fire in, in California or Southern California history to, to date at that time. Yeah, that's it's interesting how that's changing. Uh, in 2003, I was a part of initial attack on the old fire, which was uh, a part of the Grand Prix fire. I don't know if you remember or were part of, of those incidents, but uh, it basically started the west side of, of, uh, of L.A., and then burned up into the Cone Pass, and then the secondary fire, the old fire started, and burned down the San Bernardino Mountains and then burned back up. Uh, and at the time, that was one of the largest fires in California history. And I think we lost, I want to say, 2,000 homes. And since then, obviously, the, the fires have, have gotten bigger than that, and it seems like every year there's something that's bigger and bigger, which is it's wild. And I think you know part of it has to do with the fact that we're building homes everywhere. We're leveling mountains to, to build homes, so... You know, all these homes are in these urban interface environments. So I think just as a natural result of that, you're losing homes through that. I think you nailed it. I think that's the change. People see more loss and they think, oh, these fires are getting worse. No, it's it, the fire behavior is the same. It's cyclical. It's like it comes and goes. We have droughts and we have big fires and then we have season, seasons where there's no fires and it's pretty, pretty quiet. But like you said, they're building homes closer to these areas that burn and it's very unfortunate that these homes are subjected to that. And I don't think people realize, and they just probably figure, well, you know, it's one in a million that it's this forest is going to burn and I'm probably safe. And they're really not, unfortunately. Well, I, I took us down some, some more rabbit hole there. I want to get back to your agency. <laughs> um, I think a lot of people know where the Sierras are, but the Sierras is a huge mountain range. Can you talk about where Kern County is in relation to, I guess the state of California, you know, whether it's it's kind of central in California, but kind of where it lies and what the topography is like there. We're still considered Southern California. We're just north of L.A. County. In fact, we respond to a lot of calls that El- with L.A. County in conjunction with them. We're borderline Ventura, Santa Barbara County um, as well. And yeah, we cover a huge area. Um, it's like double the size of L.A. County but we don't have the population. So we have like 8,000 square miles or something like that, but we have maybe less than a million people where LA County, where I grew up is, I believe 4,000 square miles and 10 million people. Just to kind of give a perception of, of how spread out it is. We have, I believe, considering the response area, we, we only have just a little over 500 firefighters and we have 47 stations throughout the County of Kern and the area that we respond to, you know, it's, it, there's a long stretch to get to a lot of the areas. The helicopter is usually the the quickest response when it comes to a rescue because of how remote and spread out everything is. And yeah, it's, it's just a big area. And we, we, so we have the desert, we have oil fields, like we're primarily known for like the oil industry. There's a lot of oil fields out there. In fact, fighting fires out in the oil fields is some of the sketchiest firefighting I've ever done. Um, there's power lines throughout and they don't just string across a canyon. They literally crisscross and they're different levels and you can't see them and just super challenging. Um, that area burns a lot and we have, you know, the mountains in the Southern Sierras. So we have the Kern River. We have a lot of water rescues along the Kern River. And then we have the desert side. We have Mojave Desert and probably some of the windiest parts of California or Southern California are right there in that area. I mean, we're just west of Mojave where the windmill farms are. That's obviously where California is like, we're getting our energy from here. This is where all the winds are. And it's pretty surreal to be flying in that area, um, knowing that that's some of the most extreme areas we could operate in. Yeah. Like you said, from extreme low in the desert to extreme high in the Sierras and everywhere in between kind of from, from there. Um, from a fire response standpoint, I know in the in the desert you've probably a lot of light flashier fuels, but you get into the the Sierras and you've got you know a lot of timber. What's what's your experience been in the different types of firefighting uh, when it comes to you know fighting fire in the desert versus versus like the the heavy timber? Yeah, we we don't really get a lot of fires down in the desert. Most of our fires are actually pretty close to where we're stationed. Um, we're right next to Fire Station 11 with the Kern County Fire Department. There's a, a train that goes through a very famous train. It's actually, there's a camera on the Tehachapi Loop. And so a lot of train enthusiasts are watching that live camera. Those trains that go through there are constantly starting fires. <laughs> Every summer we probably get, you know, 
10 or 15 fires just in that area and it's all rolling hills and it's grass. So it's like flashy fuels with, you know, some oak trees. And so that that's kind of our common go-to area, but then we do respond to areas where there's tall timber and, and, you know, no matter what we do, we're not going to put the fire out. We're just there to hopefully try and slow it down and let the guys on the ground do their thing and give them time and buy them time and support them. And usually when we go to fires up in the mountains where there's, um, you know, a lot of uh, thicker, uh, dense vegetation, we do get other resources brought in. We get heavy, like type one helicopters. We're getting the heavy helicopters out there to, to assist us. And we're getting air tankers. Um, we even get air tankers on a lot of the grass fires in the oil fields because they just move so fast. We, we just can't catch them and water sources are few and far between. There's definitely a lot less areas to get water. So our turnaround time is very slow. So there, it's definitely challenging as far as fighting fire, as far as, you know, the, the water sources and the topography and the terrain and the winds and whatnot. So it, it's, um, it's different. <laughs> yeah. With the, the snowpack we had last year, it was a record year for the Sierras and for a lot of California. What, w- what were the r- rescues like water-wise this year for you guys? Have you seen an increase in, in rescues because of that? We had a lot of flooding. We had roads wash away. People were stranded. Um, people needed rescuing, you know, just there by, uh, you know, the, there was a couple towns where people were stuck in their homes. People were stranded. And like I said, roads washed away. So we were, we were actually out patrolling and we staffed two helicopters. Normally we only staff one helicopter, but we brought in extra pilots and we had two helicopters covering um, due to all the flooding and the damage and the rescues and whatnot. It was that extra snowpack created a lot of work for us it was very busy this last winter was wild i feel like you know i, I live in in the mountains uh the sun the san Bernardino mountains and we had that storm in, in february march that dropped 10 feet up here and, and it's just not something we're used to so it the, i think most residents up here are, are still scarred from this last winter and it's getting cold and you know everyone knows winter's coming but i think everyone's you know very uh reluctant to accept any snow in the forecast so we're <laughs> We're hoping that we get some some rain and maybe not so much snow. That was that was a, a brutal brutal experience this last winter. Yeah, I agree. I'm ready for more rain and less snow. <laughs> but for Kern County Fire, your aviation program in general, can you talk about? You, you started to talk about staffing uh, your equipment. Can you talk about uh, how many people are assigned to aviation and the mission f- profiles you fly and and what type of aircraft you fly and whatnot? We basically operate two Vietnam era Hueys, UH-1H Super Huey. And, you know, as you know, they're, they're older aircraft and they're getting more difficult to maintain. So it's, it's tough when something breaks and something will, these aircraft are, you know, 60 years old. It's, it's been a challenge. We, we actually have a Bell 412 um, EPX on order. And well, we should nice. hopefully get delivery of that next year. Yeah. We're excited for that. Um, it'll also be nice to have that extra, engine um we operate at night um single engine on fires and rescues so that that does add extra risk but typically um at the fire station there's just you know a pilot and for the fire it's a, it's a pilot and a captain and then for the rescue it's um pilot captain and two rescuers and then we have a fuel truck driver and there's always a mechanic and then we have a seasonal firefighter who will drive the support vehicle to chase us on an incident with the fuel truck and that's really all we have so basically like really 16 guys um in our air unit and then maybe up to like 30 with the extra help and then that number might bump up to 40 because they will use captains and engineers and firefighters from fire stations to come in and cover so let's say some someone wants to take vacation they they don't just keep that in air operations they have guys they have a pool of guys that they use within the department that we bring in and we keep them trained and we keep them current so we have more more guys to use and then we also have extra help part-time pilots that we bring in so then you're not relying on just the only three pilots there's chief pilot myself and another pilot if we have to staff two helicopters that's quite difficult to do with just two pilot or three pilots so we we do hire extra help part-time guys and and that's kind of how i got my start i got hired um in fact pretty much every pilot at kern county we we started out as extra help part-timers before we went full-time and you know as you know those those jobs are tough to get you gotta wait for someone to retire yeah absolutely 
And I think that's a, that's a good way to, to go about it as well. It gives you a chance to see one as a pilot. Do I like working here? Do I get along with all the people that are in this agency? And then from the agency standpoint is the opposite. You know, is, does this person fit in well? Is it, is it a good fit? So it's, I think it's a, it's a good method if, if it works uh, in, in that way. You talked a little bit about fighting fire at night and that's something I feel like is, is really changing on the, the fire front. Uh, it seemed like up until recently, that wasn't something that was very common and maybe that's not correct. It, maybe it's just my outsider's point of view, but is that something that you're seeing change and, and what's kind of spurring that change to now include nighttime firefighting? I think it's um, what you touched on earlier. There's more homes out there in the areas that burn. So the need to have helicopters drop water at night and to slow the fire down or prevent it from burning those homes. Like we have um, minimums like requirements that we that we uh, basically fly under. You know, it's like life and property are threatened. If not, then we don't fly. So if the oil fields are burning and no homes are threatened and no life is threatened, we let it burn. We don't fly at night for that. So it's only when, when homes are threatened that we fly. But yeah, I think that's that's the, the big change is more homes in those areas is, are being implemented. I just saw that Colson won a the three year, I think it's a three year extension on that QRF contract and they're flying at night. And that was, you know, I guess what really drew my attention to the nighttime aerial firefighting was what, what they were doing uh, with that tri tri county area, do you think you'll see continue to see more of that spread throughout um, the Western United States and then ultimately across the U.S.? Thanks to our sponsor, Anodyne Electronics Manufacturing, a leading manufacturer of trusted special mission avionics for law enforcement, aerial firefighting, and utility operators. Visit www.aem-corp com and learn how AEM's digital communication and loudspeaker systems, avionics consoles, radios, and specialty audio products can support your most demanding missions. You know, it's it's really hard to say. I definitely think the Western U.S. the the need is more, mostly California. I mean, this is where we we continue to have the fires in the dead of winter. You know, we're still catching fires. Just the other day. Um, wasn't on my shift, but I, I came on shift and the pilot the day before me, he had a fire and it's in the thirties. It's cold and we're still catching fires. So yeah, I, I definitely see a need for it out here on the West coast. Going back to some of the technology that's, that's getting better as time goes is, is the increase in NVG technology and some of the glass cockpit stuff, is that lending to that overall ability to do that as well? Or has that kind of always been in place and just the risk uh, has changed with the homes? I think it's always been in place. And I think every uh, like major department, such as, you know, you've got LA County and LA City, San Diego City, um, I believe even Santa Barbara, they, they've they all always flown at night. It was some of the other agencies like Orange County Fire only recently started flying at night, I believe maybe 10 years ago. And then Cal Fire is following suit. They're starting to implement night flying. Kern County has been flying at night forever, just like LA and LA or LA County and LA city. So every, every agency is different and it's just the need for the response area. And that's really what it boils down to is the need. And I think like for Cal fire, they're starting to see more homes be threatened at night due to those homes being developed in those areas that weren't previously there 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. You, you kind of started to allude to this earlier with the pilot selection for Kern County, but what does the pilot selection look like for, for folks that are wanting to, to go in as a, a pilot, as a f firefighting pilot there? Like what are the minimums? What do you see in there? And, and what's the overall kind of selection process look like? We have three full-time pilots. And until one of us leaves or retires, those slots are locked up. But we are open to extra help pilots. And our minimums really aren't very high. They're, um, you know, I think 2,500 hours total time and th uh, 300 in a medium and I think 500 mountain time and then just having, you know, the experience, you know, firefighting rescue is a bonus. Um, having night vision goggle time. You look at some of that stuff, you know, uh, like how do I, how do I get 500 hours of, of long line time with 500 hours of mountain time? And, you know, all the, all, it seems like there's a, a bunch of different little things, but like you said, you, when you were in your early part of your career, you kind of structured your jobs based on, meeting some of those, those criteria, which makes your 
your background really interesting and your your experience as a pilot pretty vast, I would imagine. I made sure to to work my way up. So I started out in type threes and, you know, A stars and four oh sevens on fires. And then in order to build my medium time, I pretty much had to start flying for free to get the hours. I would find pilots who were ferrying helicopters or coming off fire contract and I'd say, Hey, you know, I'll pay my way, you know, if I can fly with you and you let me fly the aircraft. That was how I built a lot of my time. And then just flying the S-58 doing heavy lift construction because there were no minimums to have time in that to fly construction. It's only for the fire contracts. I had the total time for mediums and it was just getting that, that Huey time. And then finding a company that was willing to, to hire me with, um, you know, very minimum experience and then just go out and do the job and, and learn on the job. And a lot of what I've done um, throughout my career is is on the job training you really can't train for a lot of the stuff you do like firefighting and and rescue you i mean you can go out and you train and do hoist rescue training but until you actually go do the real rescue there's there's nothing else like it yeah that's on the job training is irreplaceable in in law enforcement as well in a lot of ways it's been interesting as you know on the tactical flight officer side i feel like there's a lot of uh, technology advancements that's made it to where you can train now on the ground as a, a tfo you can manipulate camera systems that that mimic kind of what you'd see and what you'd, what you'd experience in flight. So it makes that on the job training uh, a little more streamlined and, and hopefully gets folks up to speed faster when they're, when they're filling those, those positions. Uh, Richard, is that something you guys had a, ch- a chance to do as much of the ground-based training? Yeah. I mean, it, certainly the latest, the more software-based equipment that we use, the easier it is to implement a ground-based version for you to train on. Certainly, um, that that is the case today. It wasn't always the case, and we found that trying to uh, teach someone to operate a camera system, for example, the only way to do it on the ground was to put the aircraft on external power. And you can go through some very basic functions on the ground, but you can't replicate the automatic functions, the, the GPS-enabled stuff that only kicks in when you're actually flying. So I think... The latest generation of kit is coming with simulators on the ground that you can um, that you can use. I, I suppose w- just one question that that kind of popped into my head when you were talking about your new aircraft that you're that you're um, getting next year is: will that come with any technology that is going to make you know stuff that you would love to have now in the Huey, but it's an old aircraft. Is that going to come with any technology? And one one of the things that struck me is when you were talking about the the power lines and the environment in which you work, the sort of topographic and, and the hazard uh, information that we now take for granted as overlays on our mapping systems that the TFOs routinely have. You know, is that a consideration for the new aircraft to bring these safety enhancements into your mission to make it safer and give you more? Uh, situational awareness. You know, I don't know if the technology is there to to show the all of the the small wires that are down low level below you know 500 feet or below 100 feet. Um, we do have um, you know we have our iPad, which actually has a, a program that shows the major power lines. All of those come up, but the little power lines, we just we don't have that technology, and and I'm. Not real familiar with the equipment that will be in our 412 EPX. I'm not sure we will have that technology, but I do know that as a pilot, if you're looking inside, you're going to hit something. So your eyes are always outside and you're really going to rely on hopefully your captain in the left seat to call out any hazards that he knows or sees. Um, but really, I can't rely on any of that equipment. One thing that we will have that I think is going to be a huge thing for me is we're going to have a night sun. Right now, we currently operate without one. So we're just, you know, out there, single engine in a Huey, no night sun, just our standard lights that come equipped on the the aircraft. I believe that night sun is going to add that extra safety factor to be able to throw some light down in a canyon at night where we're doing a rescue. It's going to enhance that night vision capability on those nights where we don't have a moon. Um, we're going to have autopilot, which will be great in case we ever go inadvertent. That'll be a feature that'll be nice to have. And obviously the, the extra added engine and and the the power. The aircraft's gonna have a lot more power than the Huey. So that'll that'll be a nice thing to have, especially at altitude. Well, I've noticed a, a few of the recent uh rescue ships that have been uh 
released and, and purchased by agencies have come equipped with uh, MX10 camera system or shot over camera system. Is that something you guys will be able to, to add to that for the rescue operations? You know, they haven't talked about it. And I think anything we add adds weight, unnecessary weight. So if it's not something that we um, find that we need to use, we're probably not going to use it. So there there really hasn't been any, any discussion on the need for that as of yet. I see. Okay. Yeah, the, everything I hear and, and see on the EPX is really exciting. It's a, it's a beautiful aircraft and performance-wise, it, it looks amazing. So that's that'll be a huge upgrade for you guys. Yeah, for sure. We talked about a little bit, we talked about the oil fields and, and some of the winds, but you know, given the topography, again, the Sierras are, are huge. What does, what challenges exist, you know, flying in, in that, in the area that you're flying in when it comes to, to topography and weather? As I mentioned before, just the, the winds where we operate, we have extreme temperature conditions. We, I, we have some of the most unique clouds I've ever seen in my career because of the the high speed winds at elevation. Um, we'll see a lot of those blown out clouds. Um, I was leaving work the other day and there was, it looked like, like layers of pancakes, these clouds. It was just, it was really cool. Um, but I don't want, I don't like flying in that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's cool, cool, from it's a cool to look at for, yeah, <laughs> from the ground, but um, yeah, it's just, it's the, the elevation, the, the altitudes, the confined areas, it's the ever changing weather you know, um, it's triple digits in the summer and then it's just freezing and snowing and the cold in the winter. And, and we, we go out and train. In fact, we'll go out and we'll do night hoist training. And I, I feel terrible for the guys cause they're just out on the skid freezing, <laughs> you know, I'll turn the heater on and I still have my window open because I got to see, you know, our windows are so old that you, you don't get a clear image. You always fly with your window open in those old helicopters, but, um, rain or shine, they're open. But yeah, it's really just that. And also, you know, I, I spent my whole career flying in the LA basin and I was used to flying in basically what they called the soup, the bad weather down there. I've never seen fog come in so quick, um, up here in the, in the Sierras. I was coming back from a rescue once and, uh, I saw the, the clouds moving in and the fog across the ground and I knew we weren't going to make it back to the station. So I was getting ready to shoot the approach into the airport and I, for a second there, I was thinking, am I going to have to land on the field out here outside the airport? But I made it to the airport. And as soon as I landed, it was the most amazing sight. The, the fog just encompassed the helicopter instantly when I touched down. It was insane. And we didn't see it coming that fast. We thought we had more time. So it moves really quick. So those are a lot of the challenges. Um, you know, I've had to do rescues at night in the snow. I remember we went on a rescue just last winter where we had to say no twice. Uh, I went out, I attempted it. The The snow was falling. I'm on goggles and falling snow in the mountains at night. No moon, obviously. I couldn't get to the patient. And so we went back and we shut down. I don't remember for how long. And then we went up and we gave it a second try and still couldn't get to them and went back. And I'm like, all right, we're, we're just going to keep trying. The weather is eventually going to change. And it did. The weather changed and we got there and we got to them. But I just remember thinking, Oof, this is, yeah, this is... um. It's challenging. There's a lot of changing weather. It changes very quick up here. It's beautiful, but I think it's beautiful because they get a lot of weather, you know, and, yeah. and that's what makes, yeah. that, that's what makes it green in the Sierras and, and that's what gives the snow and all the, the cool parts from a recreational standpoint, but from a flying standpoint, I can see that being, you know, su- super challenging outside of, you know, the, the topography that the airspace that you guys fly in, I imagine it's, it's all kind of class G unrestricted airspace. Yeah, for the most part, we, you know, we, we are actually operating in a restricted area. Um, we're in an MOA, so we have a, a letter of authorization for, uh, I think it's restricted area 2515 Edwards Air Force Base and that whole area out there. Mm. And there's several uh, restricted areas that overlap each other. It's like kind of like flying in LA's airspace with all the overlapping airspace up there. We have overlapping restricted areas and MOAs and for the most part, we we don't really have to um, talk to anyone until we get to this one restricted area out in the desert near Edwards. And then if we're going to go to any rescue, we've got to get permission to go in. And, and we've never had a problem. They're they're very accommodating. They know we're going out there because we've got to rescue someone. And there's a lot of quads and dirt bikes getting in accidents out there. And um, that's all in that restricted area. And it's usually never a problem. That's cool. Well, it's not yeah. cool they're getting crashes, but it's cool that it's not a problem <laughs> for you guys. 
Yeah, ne- never a problem to get to them. But yeah, I've never, you know, I'm I'm glad I gave up riding dirt bikes because this job <laughs> would make you want to quit riding dirt bikes after seeing how many people, like most of our patients are riding dirt bikes. Yeah. As as far as uh, military equipment out there, have you seen any, any interesting equipment out in the, either on the on the ground or flying? You know, I I feel really stupid. I can't remember what it was, but there was a test flight of something like a year or two ago, and it was super spectacular. And I don't think I can't remember if we flew out there to watch it or we watched it online. Um, but yeah, there's always like test flights of some aircraft out there out of um edwards it's it's pretty cool and then even just like coming off shift i'll drive home and there's fighter jets flying low level over the car and over the highway and and that's that's pretty cool to be a part of that yeah absolutely i as a kid got to go to edwards to see one of the shuttles land and that was that was really cool i always remember going there and there's you know a million people see a cars and the actual landing was pretty pretty short you know once the thing was on the ground it was all over and you didn't really see a whole lot. You heard the sonic boom and then you kind of the approach was quick and it was, it was a little bit anticlimactic, but it was still a neat thing to be a part of as a kid, you know? Yeah. I remember going out there too, as a kid, that was very cool to be able to do that when we were growing up. You know, we kind of talked about this a little bit earlier uh, and we talked about it offline a little bit, but can you talk a little bit about the challenges of, of being a female in, in aviation and public safety aviation in general tends to be a, a, a male dominated profession and you've had a long successful career so you've got a, a lot of great experiences to share, but uh, what's what's your experience been? Thank you to our sponsor, Metro Aviation. Metro Aviation, the world's largest family-owned air medical operator, offers comprehensive aircraft services with 140-plus aircraft in over 25 states. The Completion Center installs medical and law enforcement kits and avionics, serving diverse aviation needs, including offshore, utility, VIP, and corporate sectors. You know, for the most part, it's been good. Obviously, there's challenges, and I think you have to have thick skin, and you you can't take things personal, and you can't be sensitive. I think I wouldn't have gotten this far in my career if I was. And I think there's a lot of times where I've just been desensitized to certain um issues that have come up because I I love what I do so much that I don't let anyone that I'm working with affect how I do the job. Like, um, you know, I've had times where maybe someone I worked with didn't didn't necessarily want to work with a woman or fly fly with a female pilot and they were um maybe not necessarily nice towards me, but I still treated them with respect and looked out for them. You know, if if they were in a situation where I needed to save their life, I was going to risk my life to save theirs, regardless, knowing that this person didn't like me. It would throw me under the bus and get me fired if they could. I still would take care of my guys. And so, you know, there's just, there's not a lot of women who do it. I've, I know this sounds so cliche, but I've been the first, like almost everywhere I've worked, like in the fire, when I was um, flying in the private sector and I was contracting to the Forest Service as a, a pilot, I was the first female pilot on an exclusive use contract in Region 5. I was shocked at the time that I was the first female. Um, since then, I think there's been more women. And then I was the first female helicopter pilot to fly for Cal Fire. I was the first female pilot, fire pilot to fly for Orange County Fire and now with Kern County Fire, there there just aren't a lot of women who do this. And there's still no women that fly for any of the other local agencies. And I don't know if it's, you know, it's just one of those careers where I think women just don't realize they can do this or um, they're discouraged because of the culture, possibly. Um, you know, I, I had issues a few years ago at, at one of the departments I was at where I wasn't welcome there, it was made very clear that that they didn't want me there. They didn't want a woman there. And I left a really good job and went to that department regardless because it was a department that was, in my mind, my dream job. And and despite how I was treated, I it was some of the best experience of my life. In fact, I still miss it. I'll drive four hours to get to work because I love this job. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter um, where it is. In fact, I spent my whole career making sacrifices, working out of state and driving and flying and being away, like driving far and like spending a whole day, 14 hours driving to Northern California when I worked for Cal Fire. That was insane. 
you know, I bought a camper to put on the back of my truck so I could pull over and actually sleep <laughs> and live in it. I, I made any sacrifices and I spent a lot of time away from home. It was important to me to have a job closer to home where I could spend more time at home and have that quality of life because these helicopter pilot jobs are very nomadic, especially in the private sector. When you're not working for an agency, you're you're just going wherever the job takes you. So I spent a lot of time away from home. It's wild that you had a you bought a camper, you know. Yeah. That, talk about <laughs> talk about dedication, you know. Yeah. Sleeping on the side of the road to make yourself available to go to work. Yeah, and I actually picked up a lot of overtime at some of the other. So we had ten bases throughout the state of California, and I was able to pick out overtime and work at other stations and bases because I I had my home on wheels. I was uh, never an inconvenience to any of these air operations. I was the only female pilot, so they weren't used to having a female. So they didn't, they weren't set up for it. They didn't have separate bathrooms. They didn't have sleeping quarters. So by providing my own place to sleep, it, it just made it that much easier for everyone. And I, I loved it because I liked having that camper. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. It's your own space. You know, it's, you know, it's clean and it's, it's yours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, well, given where our industry is just public safety in general and in aviation in general, uh, recruitment and retention is a, a big issue, and you know f- females represent half of our population. So how do we how do we reach out to the, the female population and and try and encourage them to become a part of the solution of, of recruitment and retention in our industry? You know, I, I think a lot of female pilots that are out there now that weren't there when I was starting out um, are doing a really good job with exposure. Um, when I started flying 33 years ago, there were, we didn't have these social media platforms. We didn't have Facebook. We didn't even have MySpace. (laughs) You know, we didn't have any of that with all the social media platforms and with the acceptance of, you know, influencers and those being careers for people. I think a lot of female pilots are shedding light on a job that a lot of women didn't think was possible. So I, you know, give credit to a lot of those women out there who are putting, themselves out there and and sharing their stories. Um, you know, when I was trying to shed light on my career and, and being one of very few female pilots in, in the industry, when I got my start, it was frowned upon to, to put things on social media. I think, you know, as we talked about earlier, I had a blog and there was a lot of employers that said, you know, you can't, you can't maintain this. You're, you're not going to be taken seriously as a pilot. You need to not have social media. For a very long time, I was kind of scarred from that and stayed away from it. And I'm just, you know, even now I'm still very careful because I do work for an agency. So what you put on social media is not only a a representation of yourself, but it's a reflection of the department you work for. So I think I'm just very conservative when it comes to that. But I I do feel that I could probably do a better job of trying to put um, more out there to encourage and inspire women and you know, a lot of the fire departments will do what they call a girls empowerment camp where they try to recruit more females into the job. You know, that's something that I try to get involved in. And generally those are for female um, firefighters on the ground. They, they don't do that for pilots. So we don't really have a like a pilot specific uh, recruitment. Really, it's just networking and talking to other women. And um, there's a, a group called the Whirly Girls that's been around forever. Um there are several thousand members now. I think I'm uh, number 831. <laughs> and um, I think being a part of that helps women encourage each other and support each other and create opportunities for, you know, scholarships and, and jobs and whatnot. That's definitely one of those things that's helpful. I think that's really key, isn't it? Because it might not be about recruiting female pilots necessarily into your specific unit, but it it's it's that inspiration of the next generation of young girls that are thinking about a career and might be you know if if you can see if you can see it you can be it it's that whole you know it, it, inspiring them i think you should be very proud of the fact that you've been the first to do this it been the first to anything is always difficult and i think you know i, I certainly found that when i when i had female i mean I, we do have female uh, helicopter pilots within police aviation but but literally one or two um i don't think we ever had we have ever had one at Lo- in london um yet and we'll wait for that day to come but certainly female tfos when i arrived there was one when i retired there were 
um, a third of the workforce was female, but we, we had to overcome things and start thinking about things like, you know, we gave them flight kit that didn't fit. It was men's flight kit. So, you know, there was, when you're saying to someone, you in a, a, it was interesting when you said about there was no uh, female restrooms and, and, and I kind of get that there's legacy there and some buildings have been built over time and it costs money, but if you arrive and they say, oh, by the way, you're not, you know, here's men's kit. You're just going to have to make it work. It doesn't fit you, but never mind. That's not inspirational for the next generation. So I think it, it, you are, tra- you know, blazing a trail and the, the, the work that you're doing uh, with other female pilots on social media can only make that better, can only make more, inspire more young girls to come into law enforcement, to come into firefighting and to come into aviation. I would love to see the day. I mean, I I don't know if it'll happen in my career because right now there are only two other females in Kern County Fire Department. I'm number three. Um, So of the 500 and something firefighters we have, there's, those numbers are very low and, and, and it was low at Orange County and, it was a little higher at Cal Fire, mostly because it's California and it's a huge fire department, but there were still no women in any of the, the helicopter bases or on the helitac crews. There was no female captains. And I I just, you know, I had hoped my goal when I was at Orange County, actually, because I knew a lot of the women there, I, I was hoping to have the first helicopter with a female pilot, a female captain and a female medic and rescuer. And I just, that was like my dream and, um, you know, that was definitely met with some resistance. <laughs> but, you know, what, when you touched on like uh, uniforms, it was that way at Cal Fire. When I got hired there, they'd never had a female um, pilot. They had to custom order my flight suits for me. And they took a long time because even the the company that sells them, they don't keep them in stock because there's not a lot of women. So when it came to ordering women's flight suits, the company had to like sew them from scratch and it would take like months. And I'm like, are you guys growing the cotton or like, why is this taking so long? (laughs) You know, like it would take like six months to get a flight suit out of them. And so in the meantime, I'd wear the the male flight suits that never fit right. And um, touching back on like social media, you know, when I was blogging, I, I do recall going to some of those heli expos and going to some of the whirly girl events and meeting some of the female helicopter pilots that I never met, didn't know who they were. And a couple of them, I remember approached me one year, I was at a convention and they came up to me and they introduced themselves and they said, Hey, I just want you to know, I appreciate your blog because if it wasn't for your blog, I would have quit flying. They said they weren't being treated right. They were dealing with a lot of issues and they said you know it was there was obviously they were dealing with discrimination or whatever treatment they were dealing with and they said because of how i would blog and share like how awesome it was you know and, and how positive i always was despite anything that happened and they 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 said that's what kept them going and and that was very emotional to me and very rewarding and i remember you know getting messages from parents saying that you know their their children wanted to become pilots because of what they had seen me go through i just hope that maybe somehow i can be able to do that again and be that person for someone and inspire them it's interesting to see how how the way we consume media has changed you know no longer do we sit with a newspaper out in front of our face we go online for our news and uh, a lot of the younger generations are consuming all their news through social media. That's where they get all their news sources. So th- these governmental agencies that are looking to recruit folks have a direct access, have direct access to the, the, the future police officers, firefighters, pilots, all these, these different jobs where we're having difficulty recruiting and they've been slow to the game as far as allowing their personnel to, to post and, and promote their agency and their, their job. It's getting better. But, you know, when you look at what they trust us with, they trust police officers with a gun. They trust us to fly helicopters, drive police cars with lights and sirens and drive through, you know, uh, congested intersections. But the one thing they're afraid of is us having social media power. And that's actually the one thing that'll benefit, I think, most agencies in the long run. The problem is, you know, like like every other thing, there's a rule created because of somebody who who, who did something stupid. Uh, But, you know given the responsibilities that most folks have in air, in air support and aviation, I feel like most of us are smart enough to, to know what to put out and what to promote and what not. So 
hopefully as as we progress and, and go down this this road, some of those guidelines become a little more lenient as far as you know how they're allowing folks to share information. Because I guarantee if if you were able to put a picture out of, of your flight every day and people saw that, that would be inspirational to to a ton of people. I hope that continues to get better and I really appreciate you uh, you joining us. It's been really cool talking to you and, and hear about your story. Really inspirational. You know, 30 plus years in aviation is a, is a big deal. So congratulations to that. And, and man, it's looking at all the hard work you've put in over the years. Uh, definitely impressed with your grit, your determination, and your passion for, for the industry. But before we close out, Richard, do you, do you have anything you want to throw in there? No, I mean, I would echo that exactly. I think you should be very proud of what you've achieved. And I think, you know, uh, some of the adversity that you've overcome, some of the difficult situations that you've got yourself through, the fact that you're still here smiling, you're still positive, you're still inspiring uh, people to want to come into, you know, male or female pilots to want to come in and do the job that you do and you love every day. I think you should be really proud of what you've achieved. And, uh, you know, sometimes you just have to sit back and look at yourself and say, actually, you know what, I've achieved an awful lot. And I, and, you know, I'm really, really proud that I'm still turning up for work with a smile on my face every day and, and wanting to go there, keep our community safe, make a difference and, you know, deliver excellence. And you're definitely doing that. Well, I thank you guys both. I appreciate it. And, you know, like you said, it's like, you're not always going to have a perfect career and things may not always go your way. And it's trying to, to find the good in that and what you learned from a bad experience, um, you know, and to be able to come out positive and, and it makes you really appreciate what you have for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thank you guys. Yeah. Well, hopefully we catch you at HAI or, or one of the events you guys, do you guys attend HAI as an organization or agency? We do. I I haven't gone in prior years um, because I wasn't working anywhere that would, you know, I was able to, to leave and cover, but it does fall on a couple of my days off. So I do plan on being there. All right. Um, yeah, definitely hope to see you guys and we'll run into Tony Weber. <laughs> yeah. Well, Tony. Hey. <laughs> well, uh, you have to come by the vertical booth or the MHM publishing booth and, and say hello and, and uh, we'll, we'll crack a beer or a, or a gin and a gin and soda. And, uh, and, and cheers in person. That'd be cool. That works. Awesome. Thanks guys. All right. We'll catch you later. Cheers. All right. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Yeah, bye. bye. This is the end of our two part conversation with Desiree Horton. Stand by for a message after a word from our sponsors. Thank you to our sponsor, CNC technologies, CNC technologies, serving law enforcement, government, and military markets with tailored mission solutions, system training, and live 24-7 support with cnc.live platform. Explore more at cnctechnologies.com. Thanks to our sponsor, Anodyne Electronics Manufacturing, a leading manufacturer of trusted special mission avionics for law enforcement, aerial firefighting, and utility operators. Visit www.aem-corp.com and learn how AEM's digital communication and loudspeaker systems, avionics consoles, radios, and specialty audio products can support your most demanding missions. Thank you to our sponsor, Metro Aviation. Metro Aviation, the world's largest family-owned air medical operator, offers comprehensive aircraft services with 140 plus aircraft in over 25 states. The Completions Center installs medical and law enforcement kits and avionics, serving diverse aviation needs, including offshore, utility, VIP, and corporate sectors. Thank you for listening to the message from our sponsors. I want to end this with a thank you to you as our listeners. If you could do us a favor and leave us a rating and review on the platform you use to listen to the Hangar Z podcast, that would be extremely helpful to us. Lastly, don't forget to check us out on YouTube. The vertical YouTube page has recently been redone and now not only contains their amazing content, but it also hosts all the vertical helicast podcasts in a video format. Just go to YouTube and search for vertical magazine. Cheers. Time to close up the hangar. Thanks for joining us on the Hangar Z podcast brought to you by Vertical Helicasts.